saying, God, all of the message has been spoken. <laughs> the whole thing has been spoken. And, and that's good because it means that it's one spirit and also people are getting tired of legalistic teaching about marriage and single life. How many people have been told, stop having sex, don't masturbate, don't watch pornography, just put it, I, I respect people have said it today, just put it at the feet of the cross, you know? Um, but one of the things that God is doing in our lives now is he's showing us by his grace the practical implications of these things. And so my goal today is to, to teach, to talk, and to share things that will, by God's grace, redeem. Ever say redeem? redeem. It's very important you understand that word because God's purpose and plan is to redeem us. Amen. As a human being, you're made up of three parts. Spirit, soul, body. Amen. Bible teaches that our spirit is reborn, our soul is then transformed, and then our body must conform. It's interesting because we've been in the world, our spirit is alive to God, but there's particular traditions and values and mentalities about single life and marriage that need to be conformed. And so these were the words cliche, the words old fashioned. I know they can in some context they can mean particular things, I understand that. But these are the way these are the reasons why people are gonna think this is old fashioned. I would challenge you and say this is not old fashioned, this is authentic. Someone say authentic. And this is a decision by the grace of God that you would need to um, follow in order for you to actually have a single life that is wholesome. I'm a single person. I've been in a relationship while being in, um, being in the kingdom for five years. And one of the things I experienced from that is a level of brokenness and depression while speaking in tongues. Amen? Wow. I, I know we talk about being born again and we don't have, but one thing I know is that I've experienced broken relationship and I found that I experienced depression rejection, prayerlessness, amen? And so in my journey of restoration, God begins to speak to me about particular things. I'm gonna share them with you, but also I may cover some of the things that we've already talked about, is that okay? Amen. Feel free to interrupt, but I just wanna share a couple of things. One of the first things I wanna speak about is, is um, one of the things that God said to me, actually. One of the things that God said to me about four years ago, is that before I can actually get married, I need to be single. Yeah. And I was a bit baffled by that because I was single already. Um, but, he, but he said it to me quite clearly, before you're married, become single. And so some people in this place may be single physically, but just as I said to you before, with spirit, with soul, with body. And so you might have a physical separation, but you still are required to have a solical separation. You're required to have a spiritual separation. Does that make sense? I don't know if you've experienced it in your life. Um, how many people have been in a relationship in this place? Have been in a relationship while being a Christian? Awesome. How many people have experienced relationship breakdown while being a Christian? Amen. So one of the things that God had to do with me is, is he had to do with me with not just physical singleness, but spiritual and emotional sing singleness. First thing I'll say to you is that singleness is a gift. It is a gift. The gift is a present that is free. Amen. And in presents that are free, it needs to be unpacked. Amen. Just like salvation is unpacked, so is your single life. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. And so one of the things is, is, this gift, it, it impacts first from the spirit, then it unpacks in the soul, then it impacts in the body. Now, how do I practically get single? One of the things is, is I need to understand my identity. Many times when people speak about um, relationships and various things, it is out of the context of identity. Everyone say identity. Just shout out to me what you think of when you hear the word identity. Who you are. You say, I know, I know who I am. Say again. Your character. Anything else that determines identity? Individuality. Anything else? Source. Your source. Okay. Now this will relate because by the end of today, I want us to have time to pray for people and all these kind of things as well. But I just want to share this because identity actually in itself 
is the mark of the ownership. So when you have an identity, it's actually, when you have a picture, you, you sign the author's name. So that particular thing, it is not separate of itself. It is, it is um, defined by its source. Its authenticity is determined by what's written on it. That's what an identity is. Now when you apply that naturally to the world, naturally people have an identity derived from earthly things. So whether it is body type, whether it is bank account, whether it is origin, passports, all these kind of things. So people determine the identity naturally from these particular things. But when we apply this to Christianity, number one, but also to the biblical pattern. Let me say biblical pattern. One thing that we're in danger of is when we talk about relationships, marriage, and all these things, is we tend to allow ourselves to come out of the biblical pattern and go into traditional thinking. The Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. Therefore, every problem is found in the Bible. And therefore, there's a biblical solution to every problem. I didn't say legalistic. I didn't say over-spiritualized. I said that there's a biblical solution. So one of the point is, is that for us to even hear anything that's being said before some things will be sharply said, is we need to recognize the authority of the scripture. I don't mean the letter that kills. I mean the spirit that brings life. Is that okay? So, so identity is the mark, okay? Identity also can be related to three, three particular things. It can be our ability, when you know you can do something. Um, for example, God gave Adam ability. He gave him in Genesis 2, 4, 19, he gave him the ability to name things. Because of the glory, because of the spirit that was in him, he had an identity. And in that identity, he had an ability to name his situations. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Another aspect is that identity also can be, it can impact on your environment. Yeah. Okay, so if you have an identity, there's a particular environment you're found in. A fish is not found in the land. Yeah. Is that okay? Adam was placed, Genesis 2, hey, he was placed in a garden because of his identity. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Can you see it? Your identity affects your location. Okay. Um, in the Garden of Eden, he had two locations. One was the spirit realm. God made animals to live on their source, which was the land. God made fish to live in their source, which was the sea. God made man first in the, in the spirit. Is that okay? Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man. So the environment first that man was made in was the spirit. And then... He formed man, Genesis 2, 7. He formed man, okay? So he had a place in the spirit in God, and he also had an environment to live in, earth, specifically the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Also, identity, it affects direction. We can see this in the New Testament. When Jesus was revealed to be the Son of God, the Father was present, the, the Christ was there, and the Spirit was there as well. He said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm all pleased. Immediately, the Spirit led him. Do you understand that? So because of his identity, his direction was revealed to him. Is that okay? He knew where to go because his identity, the Spirit of God, was directing him through that. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, identity also affects boundaries as well. Boundaries can be physical boundaries, spiritual boundaries, emotional boundaries. Uh, the Bible says that he told him, do not eat of this particular fruit. Because of your identity, yeah. you need particular boundaries to be put in place for you, Adam. I love you. I love you. I care about you. This boundary is not to destroy you. It's there to protect your identity. Amen. Is that okay? Yeah. And so we told him this, this tree, this tree was out, off the limits because of his identity. He didn't speak to, a, to the animals about the tree. He didn't speak to anything else. He spoke to Adam. Yeah. Meaning there's some things that other things can do. But for you, 
your identity dictates your boundaries. Yeah. On a practical level, it's emotional boundaries, physical boundaries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. One of the things that's quite dangerous, actually, um, actually one of the benefits of identity is we can see it has authority. Out of an authority, like I said, Genesis two fourteen, it gives you authority because your identity actually is your authority. It also creates boundaries, like I said, it's a benefit. A benefit of identity also is direction, like I just said to you. Identity also impacts on your location. Yeah? One of the things it also does is it determines your assignment. Okay? He was a man. Ever say man? Man. So he was made after his father. We understand from earlier on, Adam was born from above. This will relate to relationships, it will relate to singleness and all these things, but it's very important for us to recognize that Christianity um, will enable, living for Jesus Christ as, as, a, as a believer will actually cause these things to manifest. Marriage and all the other things. Is that okay? He had an assignment, Genesis 2.15, tend the garden, keep it. Is that okay? Now, there is a danger of not walking identity. We can see that actually, you know, Adam sinned and there's various things that took place. But actually we can see through the scripture what happens when you don't walk in your identity, how it impacts on your environment and how this relates to relationships as well. How does, it, how does not walking in your identity affect you? Can we look in Judges chapter 16 verse 6? Adam had an identity, he had a location, all these things. In fact, one of the key things that happened, because of his identity, because he was a son of God, because his source was the Father, he was vulnerable. The Bible says he was naked and not ashamed. Samson was an example of someone who did not walk in their identity. And this impacted on his location, it impacted on his assignment, it impacted on his relationship. Is that all right? One key thing that identity does, um, what, one thing that happens, sorry, is when you don't walk in your identity, you're lo you, you start to look for particular things in the wrong places. You know, I used to rave. I remember actually when I was a youth leader about seven, eight years ago, I remember at some point um, I'd come out of the king, I'd come into the kingdom, but then at some point my desire for God or my, my desire for Jesus Christ I wasn't getting the pleasure, the desire that I, I desired at that time, so I tried to look for that desire in something else. So I went back clubbing. I remember going into the club, and I felt so awkward, so awkward. And I saw a youth leader at the time, and he said to me, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I was thinking, it's my identity. Then I said, oh, wait a minute, what are you doing in this place as well? Basically, my identity did not allow me to be in this environment. Is that okay? So I can't find, I can't find things. I can't look for things because my identity will not allow me to be there. Is that okay? Samson, the Bible says that Samson, he went in, in Judges 16, he went to the valley of Sarek. Everyone yeah. says the valley of Sarek. He had an, he was, he had an identity. He was called of God. He was God's son. And there's various things I want to go into, but he actually was not walking his identity and that impacted on his relationships. Yeah. Does that make sense? He was not walking his identity and it impacted on his relationships. And the Bible says that he met a woman in the valley of Sarek. The interesting thing about that word Sarek is it, 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 it means fruitless, barren place. And so because he was not walking his identity, he started to go to fruitless places to have relationships with fruitless people. The Bible actually says that, shows that his relationship with Delilah was fruitless. There was no product. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Have you ever had any, have you ever, I don't know about you, but there's times when I've not walked in my identity, I've started to form relationships. I know we're supposed to love everybody, but in terms of if it's single, looking to be in a relationship, I start to consider people that I would never consider you know, and yeah, just me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It starts off as God, give me a person of virtue, a person that loves to pray. And then when, if you ever, 
maybe if they're not praying that much, maybe they don't speak in tongues, maybe they don't need to go to church. Because of the strain of identity, the virtues and the expect the desires begin to compromise. Is it making sense? That's why I'm focusing on identity. Is this helping anybody? He met a woman in the valley of Sarek. Sarek is barren. It is, there's no fruit there. Now what happened to him? His identity affected his location. Looking for permanent things in, in wrong places. His boundaries changed. Judges 16, 17 says that Delilah began to press him. And he began to reveal the secret of his identity. He began to build emotional attachments to the wrong people. He began to, remember, is it making sense to someone? He began to start giving things that are not permitted to people because he was not lining up. Yeah. Is it making sense? Yeah. The Bible said he told her the secret of his strength. The Bible says in, in Psalm that God is our strength. He began to give pearls to swine. This can have practical application, whether it be physically kissing, sharing emotional things. You know, sometimes um, sexual sin starts with emotional vulnerability. Sometimes sex is not sex is a symptom. Sex, pornography, masturbation, all these things are symptoms of not having an identity. Is it making sense? I'm not speaking here from a high horse. God had to show me Amen. how I mistreated. I remember being in this relationship, and I remember the person, we we're, were both young, but he went to show me, actually, no, you're not, it wasn't that we was having sex, it was the fact that I was abusive emotionally because there was selfishness. Are you with me? There was self, there was a strain. When we are in God, God is love. God doesn't have love. So when I talk about identity, I'm talking about practical things like the love of God. Adam's source was love, therefore he reflected love. Like the moon is positioned to the sun, the moon doesn't have its own light. It reflects the light of the sun. So because he was positioned, not by his power, by the Holy Spirit's grace, by the physical boundaries set in place, he was doing his assignment, all these things contribute to his identity, he could reflect the love of God. Amen. When he strayed from his location, his boundaries, his assignment, all these things, he started to reflect selfishness. And his preferences become selfish. So, 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 so Samson, his father and mother were telling him, mentors were telling him, listen, you don't want to get a woman from Sarek. <laughs> you don't want to get, that's not the preference for you. Are you with me? Yeah. But because he had made decisions, his preferences were more carnal rather than spiritual. They were carnally driven. He was still in essence a spiritual man but with carnal preferences. Does it make sense to you guys? And so he told her his secret. The other thing that happens with um, not walking an identity is it impacts on our direction. The Bible says that in, in Judges 16, verse 21, his eyes were cut out. He lost his vision. Vision, did you want to repeat that? Because of his, um, the, 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 um, because of the ripple effect, and it doesn't always become gradual, I don't know about anybody, but sometimes it becomes subtle, subtle, subtle things, subtle things, you know? I know the Bible says this, and I know that the grace of God says this, but you know, this is how I feel. One of the key things about the Word of God is the Word of God sanctifies, it energizes, and it provides peace. This is not just a spiritual thing, it also does to our emotional level as well, meaning that our emotions are sanctified. Our emotions are energized by God's Word. Emotions are very important but they need to be energized by the word of God. Is that okay? How I feel is overcome by it is written. Amen? So 
he lost prophetic vision. He lost sight. The first sight he lost was of God. Vision is not just talking about my ministry or the summit. The vision we talk about is seeing Jesus Christ. This means that I can, I'm aware of his grace, I'm aware of his mercy in my heart. That affects my thought life. And my thought life affects my practical behavior. That affects my relationship. Does that make sense to you? Thank God that God restored him. The point I'm saying is, um, God restored, the point I'm saying is, can we see a danger of, of not walking in identity? Yeah. Now the question you would say is, well, what if I've done that? What if I've been in a relationship? What if I've you know, done all these things? Next thing is how, how do I get back? It would be very useless to talk about what and how. Are you with me? Well, before I say how, one of the things you recognize is there are various things that we can pick up when we stray from identity. These are where we talked earlier about um, traumas. Someone say trauma. Trauma really can be a shock to your system. A shock to your emotional system, to your spiritual system, to your physical system. And that shock produces a phobia. Can, do you understand that? I was afraid of relationships before. In the process of three, three years, there was a thought of, I didn't want to be in a relationship. It wasn't because of contentment, it was because of anger <laughs> and pain and fear. Of if, I, if I love in my perspective what love is, then will that happen to me again? Can anyone relate to that at all? So there's different kinds of trauma and trauma can be voluntary because of something I did or it can be involuntary, something that was done to me. How many people can relate that there's some things that can be done to you that are not your fault, that's affected your view of single life, your view of marriage? But the blessing is that God has provided solution by his grace. And if you're in this place, as we go through this, you'll see, and God will to speak to you, and the Holy Spirit, because this is the thing, the Holy Spirit, no matter how broken a thing is, God is a master builder. Amen. He can restore anything. Amen. And as I told you before, redemption means to buy back. He buys back spiritually, he buys back emotionally. He buys back solidly. Are you with me? First thing I said was, seek to be single. The second thing I said was, educate yourself in identity. Are you with me? How, how do we come back to identity? Well, the first point is, is repentance. Repentance. Repentance isn't a legalistic word. It just simply means to change your thinking. Matthew 26 speaks about two children. And the father told one, go and do this. And one said, I won't do it. And he changed his mind concerning himself and his father. And he did it. The other one said, I'll do it. Then he said, I won't. He, he didn't do it. And he gave it as an example to the religious leaders saying that, listen, these people, the Gentiles, these people, they've changed their thinking about themselves and their own righteousness and their direction. And they've listened to what my father has said. Repentance means you enter into the good by acknowledging the wrong. Is that okay? It's not a legalistic thing to say, listen, seven steps. No, the first thing is, hold on a minute, I'm lost. Is that okay? Hold on a minute, mate, I'm not in the right location. Hold on a minute, I'm actually in the position. And I want you to understand that there's various people in various places, so this doesn't mean that every single person is broken. There's people here who have got the grace of God working in them, they're being made whole. But I feel like I'm leading to, do, to address some people who have been broken and are still broken. Are you with me? Repentance. In different words, there's teshuva and there's metanaya. Basically what it is, is a, it is an acknowledgement. Yeah. Yeah. You can't do that with the Holy Spirit. It's not a legalistic thing. The Holy Spirit convicts you. The thing about the Holy Spirit is he does not shame you. He convicts you. Guilt is that you've done wrong. Shame is that you are wrong. The devil brings shame to make you the sin. The Holy Spirit divides you from the sin so that he can heal your spirit, your soul, and your body. Amen. Acknowledgement, a change of thinking. From that position, we go, we, we go back first practically through the word of God. And thirdly, we also find a safe person or a safe place. Is that all right? Yeah. This can apply to any kind of thing. If I mentioned trauma as one thing, there's various things I can mention. Rejection. These are the kind of things that happen when a person steps out of their identity. Anyone ever experienced rejection before? 
Rejection simply means dismissal, to be pushed away. That has a direct impact on your identity because your identity is, a part of it is your ability, social belongings. Once someone rejects you, they're saying, you are not able to meet my needs. You can't do this. That's a very painful thing. And it requires God to restore your person. Is it making sense? Find a safe place, a safe person. Allow the anger or the frustration or the trauma to surface. Most Christian people are afraid of their own anger. But actually the Bible clearly throughout Psalms especially reveals a strong witness of the importance of expressing anger without being sinful. Sometimes people can go through things that can make them angry. And that's a part of them not being restored because the anger is suppressed. There's two kinds of anger, suppressed anger and expressed anger. Suppressed anger is very dangerous because the law of suppression is this. The energy you use to suppress will be the same energy you use to keep it suppressed. And so that person, sleeplessness comes. Does anyone, there's people in this place who have not slept properly in this place. There's some insomnia because of past issues that have not been resolved, but God is going to address that and, and heal that. Amen. 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 Is this making sense to somebody? Yeah. So suppressed anger needs to be expressed. This is where the vulnerability comes back in the garden. The vulnerability. Allowing the, the, the issue to come to the surface. That's first to God through confession, and then secondly to an accountable person. Another aspect of it is, is make sense of your pain. Find a meaning. People sometimes have got very symptoms of issues, but they don't know the source. And the thing about a thought is it has an anatomy. A thought has an emotion. A thought has a will. And it has a precept or a concept, something that needs to be driven. And sometimes people can have emotions that they can't link to a particular event. And the way you start, like we heard, through counsel. Counsel is a biblical thing. Talk. Talk. Confession means to agree with God. Are you with me? So when you bring things to your heart, bring things up, and you know, people say, why, why do I need to tell God? He knows. This is the thing about relationship. The benefit of in, uh, invisibility is the sign of in intimacy. Invisibility. They were naked and not ashamed. Emotionally naked, spiritually naked. There was, there was, when you are invisible, then God is visible. Amen. Is that okay? Yeah, now, these are the things that God had to do with me. I had to be open and honest. And I'm not angry relation. I I am content, but I'm also have a desire to be married. But I'm not in a. I'm not desperate. Amen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not desperate. Okay. I'm not posting everything on Twitter, Twitter, and thing about <laughs> to hit to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Amen. God will save us. <laughs> Some people are so so bait, so obvious. You know you're in the season because everything is wedding, shoes. Hi. I'm gonna help somebody in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> but I just wanna just wanna give a biblical thing so we can talk after that. Is that okay? Then the Holy Spirit can do what he he will do. Amen. Is everyone okay? So a part, a part of it, intimacy, vulnerability. One of the things is it's a humble thing to be restored to your identity. It requires brokenness. Are you with me? It requires brokenness to come back to an identity. Is that okay? Some of us are too proud. Too high. But actually, when we encounter the grace of God, every person who encountered the grace of God fell down. Isaiah saw... Everyone who saw God, and this is the thing I want to say to you, that God wants to reveal his grace, but you can't, some of us in this place know we need to talk to someone after this meeting. We need to, and I want to say it in advance, you know you're going to need to come to the altar for prayer, but I want to say it now, don't let pride stop you, because when God reveals himself to you, the first manifestation is a posture of humility. The heart bows down. And this is a key part of restoring our identity, because it affects our perception of God, our perception 
of ourself and then our perception of people so that we can actually relate to them like God relates to, to us. Is that making sense to you? Scripture is love others as you love yourself. But you can never love yourself until you are aware of the love of God. Does that make sense to you? Make sense of your anger. Find meaning in your pain. Why am I hurt? Why am I frustrated? Why am I, you know, this is where someone mentioned about forgiveness. Why am I hurt? And this is to those who may have been broken or may be broken. Why am I hurt? This is where the Bible says, you know, um, cast all your cares upon him. God loves us so much. Cast your care. God, I'm hurt because of this, or I'm angry because I'm trauma. It's a trauma because of this, this, and this. Maybe not just to God, maybe someone else to support you doing it with God. As that happens, a sign that that's a sign that there's restoration is peace will begin to flood your soul. Is that okay? One of the things as well to restore identity is um, accept the truth about yourself. Accept the truth. Sometimes, see, the thing about it is as believers is we, we do pray, we do seek God, but we are very, one of the challenges is receiving from the Holy Spirit. Receiving from the Holy Spirit can have different practical applications. One can be accepting that he's forgiven you, forgiven yourself, 